Welcome to Journals of Self-Discovery. Welcome to this month's edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery. I want to take a moment and thank all of you who supported the TAP Press this year. It was a good year, which saw the publishing of both Awake at the Wheel, Noro Cushy's Highway Adventures, and the Unmasking of the Phantom Self, as well as my book, Subtraction, The Simple Math of Enlightenment. It's hard to believe, but we now have 12 titles in the TAP Press catalog, so if you're looking for a holiday gift, I suggest you check them out at tatpress.org. That's T-A-T press.org. This month I'm trying something different for the podcast, and that's a guided meditation. It's around 15 minutes long, and it's based on a session I led at the November Tat Foundation meeting. And I'm trying to communicate the sort of direct, interior looking that makes plain the truth about our identity. You'll need to pay attention for this meditation, so it won't be helpful to listen to while driving, for example. You should pause the podcast now until you can find yourself a comfortable position where you can close your eyes. So go ahead and have a seat and have your palms facing upward with your hands resting in your lap. That's just a suggestion. I also suggest having your back straight. I think this helps energize having the back straight and the palms upward sort of gives an attitude of acceptance to one's meditation or receptivity, being open to whatever might occur. Go ahead and close your eyes. We'll take a couple of breaths in and out just to relax a bit. So breathe in. And out. And in. And out. We're going to spend about 30 seconds or so just watching the breath as best you can. Focus on the breathing. And if you have trouble with that, narrow your focus to a specific body sensation, like the feeling of the breath as it passes your lips when exhaling, or the feeling on the inhale, perhaps the air moving past your nostrils or your lips. Find something specific that you can narrow the attention on. So we'll spend about 30 seconds now just watching the breath at your own pace. Now focus on the feeling of being in the body. And when that seems really vague to you, then focus on the feeling of a specific part of the body, like your hand, for example, and try to feel the energy or the feeling of that hand being alive or the sense of that hand in space. Whatever you can relate to in terms of the feeling of being in the body or the body being alive. And we'll do this for about 30 seconds again. So just as best you can, focus on that feeling. And if the mind drifts off, just bring it gently back into focus. I'm going to tell a story to you. I'm going to read a bit from a story, I should say. It's a story of a small New England town. It's a village really long ago. It's the early 1900s. 
Before there was television or radio or even automobiles, it was a much slower, quieter time. All you have to do is listen to this story. And imagine this New England town tucked in a valley surrounded by mountains. And on top of one of those mountains is a cemetery. That's where all the people in this town are buried. And from the top of that mountain, you can look down into the village and see all of the surrounding countryside. And this story picks up as the story's narrator is taking the reader through a tour, if you will, of the cemetery. And he's pointed out a lot of the stones in the old part of the cemetery. And many of those date back to the very early 1700s. And now he's moved to a newer section. And this is where I'll start reading. This here is the new part of the cemetery. Here's your friend, Miss Gibbs. And let me see. Over here is Mr. Stimson, organist at the Congregational Church. And Miss Soames, who enjoyed the wedding so, you remember? Oh, and a lot of others. And Editor Webb's boy, Wallace, whose appendix burst while he was on a Boy Scout trip to Crawford Notch. Yes, an awful lot of sorrow has sort of quieted down up here. People just wild with grief have brought their relatives up to this hill. We all know how it is. And then time and sunny days and rainy days and snow. We're all glad they're in a beautiful place. And we're coming up here ourselves when our fit's over. Now there are some things we all know, but we don't take them out and look at them very often. We all know that something is eternal. And it's not houses, and it's not names, and it's not earth, and it's not even the stars. Everybody knows in their bones that something is eternal. And that something has to do with human beings. All the greatest people ever lived have been telling us that for 5,000 years, and yet you'd be surprised how many people are always losing hold of it. There's something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. You know as well as I do that the dead don't stay interested in us living people for very long. Gradually, gradually they lose hold of the earth and the ambitions they had, and the pleasures they had, and the things they suffered, and the people they loved. They get weaned away from earth. That's the way I put it. Weaned away. And they stay here while the earth part of them burns away, burns out. And all that time, they slowly get indifferent to what's going on in Grover's Corners, the little village. They're waiting. They're waiting for something that they feel is coming. Something important and great. Aren't they waiting for the eternal part in them to come out clear? Some of the things they're going to say may real hurt your feelings, but that's the way it is. Mother and daughter, husband and wife, enemy and enemy, money and miser, all those terribly important things kind of grow pale around here. And what's left when memory's gone and your identity, Miss Smith? And that's the question that I'll ask you. What's left when memory's gone and your identity? And now let's just sit quietly and wait for the next thought or feeling to come up. We'll sit about 30 seconds or so, and you just pay attention as best you can and watch for the next thought or feeling that appears in the silence.
So who did that thought occur to or that feeling? Who did it occur to? And if the answer that pops into your mind is me, it occurred to me, isn't that thought me just another arising and falling in space? And whatever objection might arise to that statement, what is that but another thought or feeling arising and falling away in space? What is this me which you claim? Is it anything other than just noise on the screen of the mind? Now, if you're a little more sophisticated, and I ask, who is that thought or feeling occurring to? You might say, why, it occurs to the observer. It appears on the screen. Well, what is that answer, but more noise upon the screen? And what is that observer that you name, but another thing that the identity clings to? What's left when memory's gone in your identity, Mrs. Smith? Casting aside thought, casting aside feeling, both of which are arising and falling, what is this awareness? What is this screen or this space which is left? Does it too arise and fall away? Where does it go when the body is gone? Where does it go when the mind is gone? Where does it go when the observer is gone? What's left when memory has gone and your identity? Is your identity anything that arises in front of awareness? What is awareness of awareness? Yet another identity. We'll sit quietly now for about 30 seconds. And just watch the rising and falling of all things. And take a deep breath in and out. And in and out. And open your eyes. And thank you for spending a few minutes with me this month. And I will see you again next month with an interview. Happy holidays.